Attention to the pediatric society of pediatric oncology and a diplomate at the Philippine Society of Hematology and Blood Institution and Philippine Pediatric Society. Tuning. She is a notable speaker and a, has garnered a lot of achievements. It is my honor to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Anna Patricia Alcazaba. Thank you so much, Michael and Dr. Committee, for inviting me to give this, this talk. So good afternoon po everybody and I'm happy to see uh, a few familiar faces po no? na nasa PJ. Sino po sa inyo taga PJ? Hi, hello po ma. So thank you po. No? So I will be talking po on advances in biology and treatment of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So as you know po, ALL is the most common childhood cancer in children. It, uh, about 25% po of all childhood cancer cases in the U.S. The Philippines po around 22%. It is a cancer that arises from the lymphoid progenitor cells, no? And the peak age is 2 to 5 years. Now in the Philippines, we have a population-based cancer registry. And this is the data from 1993 to 2012. So our population registry covers result and manila. So you can see we have incidence data for childhood cancer. And the most common po is ALL followed by AML, lymphoma, and then brain tumors. So the incidence po of ALL in Filipino children is 27 per million children or adolescents 0 to 19 years of age. This means that we estimate that each year out of a million children and adolescents, 27 will develop ALL. So given our population, we expect around 1,180 cases per year. So the clinical features of ALL depends on the things, of course. So first is the lymphoblast expansion in the bone marrow. So because of the lymphoblast, there's less um, white cells, normal white cells like neutrophils, so patients develop infections and neutropenia. There are less platelets, so there's strong cytopenia and bleeding, and there's anemia. There's also both pain. And then the lymphoblast infiltrate, the organs such as the liver and spleen, so the liver and spleen are enlarged, as well as the lymph nodes, the testes in boys, and can invade the CNS causing headaches and glucomeningeal uh, enhancement. So, ALL is a heterogeneous disease because if you can see here in mga cells, it can uh, affect the develop at any point of the maturation and development of the B and T lympho lymphocyte in the bone marrow. So, but when you talk of, when you look at it, there are maybe three main phenotypes. There's the B cell ALL in 85% of cases, the T cell ALL in 10 to 15%, and very rare, around 2% of cases, is the mixed phenotype acute leukemia, wherein there's both lymphoid and myeloid markers in the skin one cell. So what causes ALL? We don't really know exactly the precise pathogenetic events, right? But we know that there are risk factors inherited, present in less than 5% of cases, and then environmental. So we know that patients with Down syndrome have a 20 times increased risk of developing ALL because of the extra chromosome 21 that is involved in hematopoiesis. And then there are diseases such as attachment and injectation wherein there's a genetic defect in the repair of DNA so that they're prone to DNA damage and leukemia. There is this ETB6 deficiency. They lack the gene involved in lymphoid development, so they're prone to leukemia. There's the lymphomania wherein they lack a tumor suppressor gene, that's the PDPP. So 2% of affected individuals will develop ALL. And then there's this newly discovered familial, inherited familial leukemia syndrome involving the Pax5 gene. So we have this whole uh, genome association uh, sequencing 
For well, they noted that polymorphism in genes in the upper most, I don't know if you can see it, in the IKZF1 gene, the CBBP gene, that confer a modest risk of BLL. So patients with this genetic defect have a 1 to 1.5 1 1 to 2 times risk of developing leukemia. Now what about environmental exposure? We know that from the data from the survivors of the Hiroshima bombing, that ionizing radiation causes acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We know because less than 5% of patients who were treated with alkylating chemotherapy, such as cyclophosphamide, they develop second cancer, such as ALF. So ionizing radiation and alkylating chemotherapy predispose patients to develop leukemia. So given a host with this genetic or environmental predisposing syndrome, their lymphocyte can be developed uh, sanguine lesion and then again yes, secondary lesion yes, sir. causing ALM. The secondary lesion can be a mutation or a gene deletion, a translocation, it affects genes involving the differentiation and development, uh, genes involved in cell cycle regulation. And the secondary lesion ribbon can be one that is epigenetic, wherein there is really no mutation. There is just some uh, modification in the transcription of the genes because the histones are ventilated and the DNA are ventilated. So there are many somatic mutations in ALM. In, there are many somatic mutations in a lymphocyte before it becomes a leukemia. And these have been categorized into molecular subtypes for B cell ALM that have prognostic significance. And the largest here is the hyperdiploidy, where in the leukemia clone, the leukemia cell of the clone has more than 51 chromosomes. That's present in 28% of B-cell ALM cases. Then there's the translocation ETV runs one involving chromosome 12, 21, in 25% of cases. Patients with these uh, chromosomal uh, mutations have a good prognosis. And then on the flip side, we have patients with BCR-ABL in 3%, MLL gene rearrangement in 9%, and then hypodiploidy, less than 45 chromosomes, they confirm poor prognosis. Now, since 2008, many more molecular um, aberrations and genetic mutations have been identified, including the BCRA bell light, the ERG chromosome uh, mutations. So what about the cure rate of ALM? So this summarizes the experience from 1966 to 2007 at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. So you can see that initially in 1966, the cure rate of leukemia was only 10%. Now they're curing more than 90%. And this is because it was brought on by optimization and intensification of chemotherapy by improvements in supportive care, and by risk-adapted treatment, wherein the approach depends on the cytogenetics and the treatment response, as measured by the minimum residual disease. One example of this approach is this protocol from Malaysia and Singapore, or mass form. As you can see, there are three treatment arms. The upper part is for the standard risk, the one in the middle is for the intermediate risk, and the one below is the high risk. So patients are categorized up front, depending on their molecular subtypes. So high risk for those patients with a BCR ABL or MLG rearrangement. And then at key time points, they measure the treatment response by flow cytometry. Their flow cytometry is very sensitive. They can detect one leukemia cell in a thousand cells. The patients with more than two or two leukemia cells in a thousand are noted to have a positive minimum residual disease, and midway, their treatment is changed 
to a more intensive regimen or they go down to a more intensive regimen. So mass poor has an event free survival six years of 81%, and for those standard risk, their cure rate is 91%. So 